chapter 4, and I want to begin reading this morning at verse 13. Paul says, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. If you're reading the Old King James, your Bible says prevent. Prevent used to mean uh, what we mean when we see precede. So it does not mean that you can stop the resurrection. Just want you to know that. We will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us sleep, not as, uh, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another, just as you also are doing. And I want to share with you this morning on this topic ready for the day, ready for the day. Let's pray and ask God's blessing on our time and his word today. Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us your holy word. It is a lamp for our feet and it is the light for our pathway. Jesus said that the word of God is like seed. So Father, we ask you to let our hearts be good soil right now, soil that can receive and retain what you want to say to us, soil that can bear good fruit. Jesus said the words that he speaks to us are spirit and life. So Father, we pray that you would send the Holy Spirit to minister life to us from your word now. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're just a few weeks into our new series called Letters from Heaven, and we've begun exploring the letters of the New Testament. We're going to be rolling through the letters that the apostles wrote to the first churches, to the first generations of believers in Christ. We want to listen to the Holy Spirit as he uses these letters to speak words of life, encouragement, and challenge to us as believers who live today. Right now, we're making our way through the Apostle Paul's first letter to the church at Thessalonica, usually just called First Thessalonians. And if you missed the first two messages that Pastor Glenn brought us in this series, make sure you watch them on our YouTube or get the CD or listen on our website, and you'll be blessed by those messages. Many people believe that First Thessalonians was the earliest book of the New Testament, the first book of the New Testament that was written. And we can see within it Paul's tender care for the very young church he had planted. He talks about how the Thessalonians were so precious to him that he would have given them not only the gospel, but his very own soul. He says that he encouraged them and he comforted them and he charged them, meaning he gave them commandments just like a father would do for his own children. And the passage of scripture that we've read this morning is a familiar one. It is a passage of scripture that rings in the collective memory of the church. Because if you've been a believer for a while, then you know you've heard this passage at funerals. Or as you've read and studied about the coming of the Lord. Or as you've read about living holy, you know these lines of scripture. 
If you go back and read chapter 3 of this letter, you will see that Paul's co-worker, Timothy, had brought him a report about how well the Thessalonians were doing in general. Paul says that Timothy had brought him a good report, good news about their faith and their love. But it seems that some within the church had questions and had maybe even picked up some incorrect ideas about the return of Christ and the resurrection of believers. Paul takes the opportunity in our text to correct their thinking and to remind them of what he had already taught them. But more than that, I believe that Paul's concern was, once again, the concern of a father for his children. How many of you know that God has given fathers the duty to prepare their children for the future? A father's call is to do what he can to bring his children to maturity. And so Paul not only wants to teach them better doctrine, he wants to teach them how to live. And if, as Paul was teaching here, Jesus is really coming, and if God will soon bring judgment on those who are evil, then simply understanding in our minds how it's all going to play out is not enough. He wants to teach them how to live, and he wants to teach them how to be ready for the day of the Lord. I see this as a dividing line for us in today's Christian world. And I hope that you can receive what I'm about to say, church. You know, there's a reason why we scoot out the side door sometimes. So I hope you can receive what I'm going to share. You know, in the Christian world today, there is no shortage of books, teachings, and movies about the last days, about the end of the age. There are few things that fascinate believers and unbelievers as much as talking about the end times. Even secular TV shows like to dig into it and explore it from every angle. I don't know why the History Channel has become the Nostradamus Channel, but you know what I'm talking about. But we need to say this, many Probably even most of these things, including the Christian ones, are not edifying to us. They don't help us to grow. They are sensationalistic. And by that, I mean they are luring you in through excitement, but they may not have too much in the way of substance. Sensationalism in end times prophecy is something which has greatly damaged the American church. And frankly, may I say, we can't tolerate any more of it. If the world knows anything at all about the coming of Christ or the rapture of the church, it knows it only as something that people keep predicting without success. Paul was not sensationalistic. Are you with me this morning? He was not trying to get the Thessalonians to buy his latest prophecy book, you know? 52 reasons why Jesus is coming in AD 52. <laughs> if you're not old enough to get that, don't worry. Somebody with gray hair will explain that to you. How do we know when popular prophecy books and movies are too sensationalistic? How can we know whether they are a waste of time or whether they will edify us. Paul's teaching gives us the key. Paul's preaching on prophecy was firmly connected to his fatherly care for the church. His main concern is to make sure that believers are encouraging one another and strengthening each other. His concern is to make sure that the believers are living right that believers are doing what's good and proclaiming Jesus while they are waiting for him from heaven. Paul's concern and God's concern is that we would be ready for the day. I don't think Paul would have sat around the fire necessarily and speculated with the Thessalonians for hours on end about every detail of the end times. That's not how Paul spent his free time. In 1 Thessalonians 3, he tells us how he did spend his free time. He says he was night and day praying exceedingly that we may see your face and perfect what is lacking in your faith. 
That's what Paul thought was most important. Church, beware of prophecy books and movies from men who don't have a shepherd's heart, who don't really care for your soul. The church of the last days is a church that must live ready. So be sure that you only listen to men and women of faith, men who care about you and who care that your heart is ready, that your heart is growing in holiness and growing in faith. Can I say this? And I hope you'll still love me at the end of the day. Because remember, we're going to go hunt the groundhog afterwards. There is no shortcut to the growth that we need. Hear me, friends. There is no man, there is no woman who can change your life or decree on Facebook that you're going to have a good day. You do with that what you want. But let me break it to you gently. Anybody who has a million fans on Facebook doesn't really know you. If people can decree a better life for me simply by posting it on Facebook, I wish they would skip all of the preliminaries and just decree us right into the millennium so we could take a nice rest. <laughs> but faithful servants of Jesus will always point us to him and tell us to get ready to see him. Let's put away Facebook fluff theology and get back to the sound words of scripture that tell us how to grow and how to get ready to see the Lord. Paul's words here in 1 Thessalonians 4 and 5 are solid words that will tell us how to be ready to see Jesus, whether he comes to receive us at death or whether we are caught up to meet him in the air at his coming. And I see here in our text this morning three critical priorities for Christian people who find themselves living in the last days. How can we be ready for the day of the Lord? Paul gives us three ways to be ready for the day, and I want to share them with you. Three ways to be ready, and the first one is this, get smart. Get smart about the Lord's return. Get smart about the return of the Lord. In verse 13 of 1 Thessalonians 4, Paul says, I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren. Now, ignorant is not an insult. Paul is not saying that we are stupid and we do not have the capacity to understand. Ignorant means you are simply lacking some knowledge that you could and should have. Okay, so Paul says, I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren. In order to be ready for the Lord's return, we need to decide that we're not going to be ignorant about it any longer. How can we be ready for something if we don't know anything about it? I have to confess that sometimes I get a little impatient with people who don't want to know about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not an attitude that's worthy of a Christian. Paul said it as bluntly as he can. I don't want you to be ignorant. In Matthew chapter 24, speaking about the end of the age, Jesus said, see, I have told you ahead of time. He wanted us to know so he told us ahead of time. Jesus also said, see to it that no one deceives you. And then Paul echoes that in 2 Thessalonians by saying, let no man deceive you by any means. And let me ask you a question this morning. How can we obey those important commands from Christ and from Paul if we don't know enough to know that we're being deceived? Paul says that part of being ready for the day is that we understand the return of Christ and the resurrection that will accompany it. Understanding those things helps us in a couple of important ways. First, it keeps us from being deceived or shaken in our faith when we hear false teaching. If you know what Jesus said in Matthew 24, you won't be fooled by somebody who comes and says, oh, look, here is the Christ, or this man is the Christ, because Jesus said, no, the Son of Man is coming like lightning from heaven. He's not going to appear mystically in the desert or to a secret group of followers. It's also important to understand these things because it helps us, second, to hold on to the comfort 
and the encouragement that God gives us about our departed loved ones and about the end of the age. In verse 13, Paul says, don't be ignorant. He says, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. Falling asleep in the New Testament refers to the physical death of a believer. It doesn't mean that when you pass away that you become unconscious. But your body, uh, we use this expression to say, has fallen asleep. Now, when a believer dies, the inner man does not sleep, but you remain conscious in the presence of God. How many of you know that in another place, Paul said, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord? And apparently the Thessalonians were confused or they had picked up a wrong, a strange teaching somewhere, which made them think that they would not see their loved ones again, or at least not see their loved ones until after the kingdom of Jesus on this earth for a very long time. And Paul did not want them to have these wrong ideas, which would cause them to be consumed by grief when they lose a loved one, like the way that the pagans would grieve. The Roman poet Catullus said, when once our brief day has set, we must sleep one everlasting night. It's not very encouraging, is it? And if that's what you believe, then your sorrow in the face of death will be a hopeless sorrow. Christians do grieve when we lose a loved one, but our sorrow is not like the sorrow of the pagans. And in verse 14, Paul says why? He says, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. When Jesus comes, the believers in him of the past will receive the new and glorious body of the resurrection, a body like the body which Jesus now enjoys. The living conscious part of them which is now in the Lord's presence will be joined with a new body which is no longer subject to aging, decay, and death. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. <laughs> then those believers in Christ who are still alive at that time, who are still in the mortal weak bodies that we know, the bodies we now have, they will be changed, or we will be changed if we live to that time, in an instant, and we will also at that time receive a resurrection body. In the letter to the Philippians, Paul says it like this. He said that Jesus will change our lowly, our weak, vile, the King James says, our weak bodies to become like his glorious body. Praise the Lord. In verse 17, he says, we who are alive and remain, in other words, those of us who are Christians who live until Jesus comes, we will be caught up with all the believers of the past to meet the Lord in the air. He says, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the, in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. This event is called the rapture. The word rapture is not found in the Bible, but it is a Latin word which means catching up or someone being taken up. And we don't have time today to do an extensive teaching on all of that, but if you'd like, you can check out our YouTube and watch the end times class that we did a few months ago called Things to Come series. Church, let's get ready for his coming by getting smart about it. Let's not be proud to be ignorant. Do you know what I'm talking about? Sometimes when we talk about these matters, you hear people say, well, I don't ever think about that. I don't ever worry about those things or think about them because it's all going to pan out. Or, well, I don't read those things because they are too complicated. But Jesus wants us to know. He wants you and me to know what his word says about living in the last days. And so he taught us these things, Pastor, precisely so that we would not be ignorant or worried or scared. You can know what's coming. And God has given us in his word everything that you need to know about living in the last days. Jesus said, be on guard. I have told you all things beforehand.
We can be ready, and Jesus will help us to be ready as we get smart about his coming. We're talking about being ready for the day, and the first way we do that is to get smart about his coming. The second way we get ready is this, get serious. Get serious about encouraging one another. In verse 18 of chapter 4, Paul says, Therefore, comfort one another with these words. In verse 11 of chapter 5, where we ended our reading this morning, he says, Comfort each other and edify one another just as you also are doing. We can get ready for the day of the Lord and also help to get each other ready by comforting one another with the message of the Lord's return and with the message of chapter 5 concerning our need to live as holy people. That word comfort is the Greek word parakaleo, and basically it means this, that you are coming alongside your friend to give him encouragement and cheer. That's a good word. Paul said the believers were already doing that, and they needed to keep up the good work of encouraging people in their faith. The word edify is the Greek word oikodomeo, and it means that you are building somebody up and that you're making them strong. Now, that's a metaphorical use of the word. It's very interesting that when the Greeks used that word in the literal sense of the word, it meant to build a house or to repair a house. So it means that you are strengthening someone. You're building up their house on the inside of them. Now, I want all of the students of the word of God to notice something today. You know that those two words, comforting and edifying represent two of the important ministries of the Holy Spirit. Everybody hear me on this. The Father sends the Holy Spirit to you to encourage you, to cheer you, and to make you strong on the inside of you. But here, Paul is saying something interesting, that it is our responsibility to comfort and edify each other as well. The Holy Spirit is sent to do this for you on the inside. But it seems that we have been sent to each other just like the Holy Spirit to do this from the outside. And if you choose to exercise it, you have a ministry just like the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the way that he encourages us, that he strengthens us, and that he cheers us on our way through this life. You may be a newer believer today, and you may feel that there isn't much yet that you can do to serve Jesus because you don't know a lot about the Bible yet. You don't know, maybe you think a lot about being a Christian yet. That doesn't matter. You can encourage people in their faith. You can tell them to keep going and not give up. You can always point them to Jesus. Or maybe you're a seasoned citizen in the kingdom and you're a little frustrated because you can't get around or get out to church as easily as you'd like. You can't attend all the events you'd like to attend. Ministry opportunities don't present themselves to you as readily as they used to. It doesn't matter. You can still contribute to the health and the strength of the body of Christ through your good counsel, through your encouragement, and by telling us how Jesus has always been faithful to bring you through. Paul says, comfort each other and edify one another. That's a ministry that we can all have, and I'm sure you would agree it's a ministry that we all need. Let's determine. Determine that you will be a Barnabas, that you will be an encourager, that you will be somebody who refreshes the people of God. Why don't you stage an intervention in somebody's life and tell them that they can make it? Ask God to give you the words that will keep somebody tonight from throwing in the towel. Find the grace to let somebody stand on your shoulders and go higher in God and in life than you've been able to go. Church, I want to say this is a ministry that we will need for the last days. If we're going to stay strong and if we're going to be ready for the day, we will need to do better, all of us, at looking out for one another and sweetly, notice I said sweetly, everybody turn to your neighbor and say, he said sweetly, go on. We need to look out for one another and sweetly give each other a push. Now you see, Jesus said that in the last days there would be so much iniquity so much sin that the love, who knows the word of God, that the love of many people would what? Grow cold. 
And so they will need to be warmed by your Christian love. The Bible says it would be more necessary, not less necessary, to be in fellowship with each other as the day of the Lord draws near. In Hebrew 10, Hebrews 10 is that famous verse that you all use to tell your kids to go to church. <laughs> Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Now that word exhort there, which means to urge God, telling us to make sure that you stay in fellowship so that you can take care of other people and encourage them. Hallelujah. Now, we often read this verse to say, you need to be in church because you need what's coming out across the pulpit. You need to be in worship. But this says you need to be in church so you can take care of other people. When you see the Lord's return drawing near, maybe you should not head off to your underground bunker in the mountains and start eating crackers. Maybe you should stick around and make sure that all of your friends make it. Maybe you should make sure, help us make sure that everybody stays strong into the coming of the Lord. You have the ability in your hands and in your tongue to strengthen those who are weak and encourage those who are stumbling. Let's make it our mission to think less about how we are doing and to think a little more about how the people in my row are doing. The Bible says, see, that the one who waters will himself be watered. How can we be ready for the day that's coming? First, get smart about the Lord's return. And second, get serious about encouraging one another. And finally, this, get sold out. Number three, get sold out. Get sold out for Jesus. Paul says at the beginning of chapter five, but concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you because you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You're all sons of light. Everybody say sons of light. Sons of light. And sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Paul, Paul warns us that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. What is the day of of the Lord. Paul was echoing here what the Old Testament prophets had written before Jesus came concerning what they called the day of the Lord. The prophets had explained that before God sets up his kingdom here on this earth, he will judge the evil that is in this world. Then Messiah will come forth from God's presence to rule the nations and begin his kingdom of justice and peace. The New Testament expands and amplifies that teaching. And so we learn here and in other places that there will be a period of time called a day. It's not a literal 24 hours, but it's, it's a day in which God will bring judgment on a world that is honoring a false Christ instead of honoring his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. For the wicked, that day will be a terrible period of time, but for God's people, the approach of that day means salvation and rescue. In verse 2, Paul says that the day will come like a thief in the night. Many people say that Jesus is coming like a thief in the night, but that is not completely correct. Paul says it's the day of the Lord that is coming like a thief. In verse 4, look at what he says. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you like a thief. It is only the wicked who are caught unawares as if a thief were breaking into the house. At the end of days, they will claim to have brought about peace and safety. But it will be a false peace and a false security, a house built on, on sand instead of built on the rock of Jesus. They will offer people a way of life with no room for Jesus and his words. But instead, they will promote every kind of evil under the sun, holding it up and holding it out to you as a good thing. 
In 2 Timothy 3, Paul describes the days we're moving into. He says, men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving. What a list. Slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of what is good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness the appearance of religion, but denying its power, its real power to save and change, <coughs> excuse me, and from such people turn away. In Psalm 2, we read about the final end times rebellion against God. King David says, the kings of the earth set themselves and his rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, meaning his Christ, his Messiah, saying, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. In other words, get rid of God and get rid of Jesus and all of their words and all of their requirements in our lives. But God will not be defeated by them or by anyone. My Bible says that the Lamb of God will triumph over them because he is King of kings and Lord of lords. And if we live in the light, if we are truly the sons of light, we will stand in God's presence and we will not be caught unawares. But the time to get sold out for Jesus is now. Paul says in verse 6, Therefore, let's not sleep as others do, but let's watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night. And those who get drunk are drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and as a helmet the hope of salvation. How are we dressed? For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through Christ who died for us, so that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Church, we are people of the day. It's time to get sold out for Jesus and watch. Jesus said to watch, learn and pay attention to the signs of the times. Look how fast time is slipping away. You know, 10 years ago, you know you could have shoveled that in 20 minutes. <laughs> right? Now it's like, where's the ice pack? Where's the Ben Gay? You know, where's the Tylenol? Look how fast time is slipping away, church. Are we living right? Are we living holy? Will we be ashamed one day at how we have spent our time? You may say, well, you're just trying to frighten me. So what? <laughs> Jesus said, in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man is coming. And Jesus said, watch therefore, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. Church, it's time for us, and I'm, and I'm not going to start listing sins, but it's time for us to put away every known sin and every rebellious attitude out of our hearts. It's time. And let me help you. Here's something we can do. Listen to how you speak. And listen to how you think at the point where you hear yourself giving out excuses. At the point where your excuses start to kick in. That's the spot at which we are not letting God change us. Got quiet. Our excuses, our excuses, listen, our excuses are what set the limits on how far we can grow in God. Amen. But our excuses can also become our best friends because they are showing us what are the pressure points in our lives. They show us where we may be resisting God and where we need to seek God for the power to overcome something in our lives. Amen. So church, we need to be on watch for our souls. Paul says not only to watch, he says be sober. Jesus warned us in Luke 21 against having our hearts get filled up with the wrong things. He said, but take heed to yourselves, Jesus said, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and cares of this life, and that day come on you unexpectedly, for it will come as a snare 
on all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. Notice, this is not just a word to the heavy partying crowd, but Jesus says, the cares of this life are also more than capable of weighing down our hearts. How true that is. We need to be sold out for Jesus and love him more than we love all these things, even more than we love the good and unobjectionable things of life. If our hearts are full of other things, then there cannot be much room left for the love of God. Elizabeth and worship team, you can come back if you would and help me, please. Church, let's be sober in our hearts. Don't say, well, times have changed. You know, loosen up, Pastor Nick. It's, it's 2014. <laughs> let's not deceive ourselves. I want you to know that the bad choices you make in 2014, they will hurt you just as much as if you had made them in 1914. Some of us need to think about where we're going and what we're doing and ask ourselves if, if what we've been doing is working in our lives. The path we've charted, some of us, has led us into a swamp. The road to success has brought some of us into an empty desert, especially in this part of the country, and has given us an empty soul to boot. Has doing it my way really led me to peace and happiness? Can you honestly say that you have confidence at the thought that the day of the Lord is coming? And that's a word for everybody. On the platform, in the seats, downstairs, it's a word for all of us. Jesus is offering us a better way. He says, come unto me, all of you who labor and are heavy laden. Anybody carrying anything in this room today? Anybody have a burden at all? Jesus said, I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, Jesus said, because I am meek and lowly of heart. You will find rest for your souls, he said, because my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Let's look inside our hearts and let's be honest this morning about our spiritual condition because God wants to set some people free in this place. God wants to make some people become sold out and on fire for Jesus again. In our Wednesday class on the book of Revelation, a great place to get smart about the Lord's return, by the way, we, we looked at how Jesus told the church to remember from where they had fallen and return to him. He said, begin, start to do the first works once again. He said, you've been serving me, but the works you were doing when I was your first love were different, Jesus said. Are we still doing first works? Are we still reaching out? Do you remember when you were so in love with Jesus that you just had to tell people about him? You wanted them to discover that fresh, beautiful love that you had discovered as well. Are we still doing those first works or have we just become a little bit mechanical? a little bit cold about it. I want to encourage you this morning, church, to get on fire for Jesus again, to get sold out, to begin to get a heart again for others to know him the way that we say we know him and the way that we sing about him. Get involved in some outreach over these next few months. Why don't we volunteer and go help Pastor Charles and the Stanford satellite team as they go out and evangelize after church. Help us get ready for our Good Friday outreach or Easter outreaches and volunteer to work those events and share Jesus with some people. Start inviting people to come to church again. Remember when you used to be that guy that invited everybody to church. Start inviting people to come out to church again. Invite people to Good Friday. Invite them to the Alpha Course. We want to be ready for the day. And we want others to be ready for the day as well. The Bible says, don't throw away your confidence. Don't cast away your confidence because it carries with it a great hope of reward. And in due season, if we don't faint, we will truly reap a great harvest. How do we get ready for the day of the Lord? How do we avoid being surprised or God forbid even ashamed when Jesus comes? Get smart about his coming. Get serious 
about encouraging one another and get sold out for Jesus. Ask God to help you once again to love him with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Church, I believe that God wants us to finish well and to finish strong so that when he appears, you can look him eye to eye and hear him say, well done, you good and faithful servant. Come on, stand to your feet and let's give Jesus the King some praise. Hallelujah. Oh, come on, give him a great praise in this house. You're worthy, Jesus. You're worthy of glory and honor and blessing. You're worthy, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you love Jesus in this place and you want to love him more, I want to invite you to lift your hands right now and let's sing one of those songs we were singing in worship that says, I just want you, Jesus. Come on, make that your prayer this morning. Sing. I want you, Lord. I just want you. to leave time this morning for us to spend a little bit of time in prayer. And I don't want to go through a laundry list of sins with you today, but today I just want to put out a call for everybody who needs to come back to a sold out love for Jesus. It's between you and him. Nobody else knows your true condition. Nobody else knows what's in your heart besides the spirit of the Lord. Maybe you've become good at pretending that everything is okay between you and God. You know, we can all do that at times, not condemning us for that, but maybe you know that it isn't all good between you and heaven this morning. And if you want to get right with God, if there's something, if there's some idol of the heart that you know needs to go into the fire of his love and be burned away this morning, or if you just want to get closer to him just because you know you just need to get closer to him, then I want to invite you to step out real fast and just come down to this altar. And let's take a moment telling the Lord that we want to get closer to him. Come on. And if you don't know whether you have a personal relationship with God, through the forgiveness of Jesus Christ, then I urge you to come. I want to ask you to come and stand up here at this altar today if you've never surrendered your life to God before. Prayer teams, I could use some prayer teams people here, please. If you want to turn away from the things you've been doing and you want to receive Jesus and his abundant life today, I want you to come up front. You can come all the way up to the steps, make room for some folks that want to come up. I want to ask you to come up. If you want to ask God to touch you and change you and save your life and turn your life around this morning, doesn't matter what you've been into. Doesn't matter what you've done. There's people here that have done things that they have never been able to admit that they've done before. And now by saying that, I'm not trying to manipulate anybody, but I want to encourage you that God says in his word, though your sins be as red as scarlet, he says he can wash us and make us white as snow. He says, draw near to me and I will draw near to you. And he doesn't say, come here and I'm going to give you a smack. He says, draw near to me and I will draw near to you and I will receive you and I will be a father to you and you will be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. Just before we sing again, and sing that prayer to Jesus. Come on and step out if you need him, if you need to get closer to the Lord. Come on, Elizabeth, lead us, please. I just want you, Jesus. I just want you. Come on, lift your hands and tell him, I just want you, Lord. Come on. 
We want you, Lord. We need your presence, Lord. We need your glory. We need your holiness in our lives, Lord. Come on, let's lift our hands. Just worship him for a minute. Come on, just tell him that he's altogether lovely. Lord, we love you. We love your presence, Lord. We love your presence, Lord. But more than just loving your presence and the feeling of your presence, Lord, we love you, Lord. We want to be devoted to you, Lord God. Lord, we want to love you. We want to serve you. We want to live holy, not because it's what we're supposed to do, but because we have a personal allegiance to you, Lord Jesus. Lord, we want to live according to the first commandment because your word tells us you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And Lord, there's none of us that can say that we've done that 100%. So Father, we come this morning. We ask you to help us, each one of us. Renew our love. Renew our passion for you. Renew our zeal for your Lord Jesus. Renew our passion, love, and zeal for you, Lord Jesus. Set us on fire with your love. Let your love burn away the idols of the heart. If you've come to the altar this morning, and you would be honest and say, I don't have a personal relationship with God, or I'm not sure if I have a personal relationship with God through Jesus. If that's you, I want you to raise a hand. And if you're in the seats like that, I want you to come. There's a heavy presence of the Lord here today. God is here to help you and unlock your life and set you free. doesn't matter how bound you may be. The Bible says that for this reason, the Son of God, Jesus, was manifested that he might destroy, that he might loose and unlock the works of the devil. So if you need forgiveness... I want you to just come, raise a hand. Somebody will come. One of our prayer teams will come to you, and they'll pray for you. If you've never had a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ, then I want you to come. I want you to be brave and bold and humble enough to lift up your hand. Somebody will come. Somebody will pray with you. One of our prayer team's people, Pastor Ruth, there's a young lady over here. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, for the rest of us, let's spend another minute. Let's sing that again as a prayer and tell Jesus that you want him, that you want him. Let's be ready, church. Let's make sure we're ready for the day. We don't want to grow cold. We don't want our lamps to start to get dim because we have so many friends. We have so many neighbors. We have so many coworkers. We have so many relatives that need him, that need him, that need to meet him, that need to have an encounter with him before it just is a little too late to easily have an encounter with him before the day comes. Jesus said that that night is coming when no man can work. Come on, let's sing it again. Come on, give him thanks. Don't applaud, but let's just let's just give him thanks. Just speak your thanks. Just speak your worship to the Lord. When we worship you, Lord, we thank you, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, come anew. Come, wind of the Lord. Come, wind of the Lord. God's moving in our midst. It's an opportunity from his presence. He's not rejecting people right now. If you feel bad, if the Holy Spirit's putting his finger on something in your life, could be anything from murder to a bad temper. Doesn't matter. If he's putting his finger on it, it's not because he wants you to feel bad. It's because this is a time to get rid of it. So his word says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Jesus said, all those that the Father gives to me, he says, he says, they're mine. He says, I'm hold on to them. He says, and no one, no one is able to take them out of my hand. Somebody needs to hear that. If you come to Jesus today, you're going to be secure in him and he'll never let you go. Thank you, Jesus. We're going to dismiss, but I don't want the people who are here praying at the altar, I don't want you to I don't want you to feel like you have to go. You can stay if you want to continue to pray, if you want to kneel at the altar. We're just going to roll. 
right into the next service of worship. But for everybody else, if you need to go, you can be dismissed. God bless you. Just take hands and we're just going to bless you in the name of the Lord this morning. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace in the name of the Prince of Peace, Jesus. And all God's people said, amen. And amen. God bless you, church.